Okay, so um, welcome all to um, this hybrid session on um, Emilius' uh, book, Emilius Christodoulidis' uh, recent monograph, The Redress of Law. Um, I am George Pavlakos, I'm the professor of law and philosophy here at Glasgow and um, a colleague of Emilius. Um, and I was um, given the task to chair uh, this first session only a few minutes ago. So please apologize for any um, um, mistakes in the in, in the um, in the procedure. Um, so so to begin with, um, great books uh, raise more questions than they answer, and this book certainly qualifies as a great one under this descriptor. <laughs> but there is another descriptor under which it qualifies as a great book. And I must say, frankly, I have never read, or I haven't read recently at least, um, such a work that weaves together traditions of thought from philosophy, law, legal theory, and critical theory uh, with such mastery. Um, so I really enjoyed the book. Um, I cut my teeth on it, uh, partly. And um, I was uh, also last night reminded of its um, ambition, depth, and breath uh, last night when I was um, 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 recapitulating um, uh, the main points. So we, I look forward to the discussion and without further ado, um, I thank you also all for being here with us. And I will ask, um, call upon Scott Beach, professor at um, Hong Kong University Law School who uh, will um, uh, open uh, this session. Scott. Can we just check whether they all here? Is the audio right for those who are online? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to be uh, back in Glasgow. Uh, I'm going to be quite brief in my introduction before turning over to uh, uh, the. Uh, oh. um, so let me just make a few very introductory remarks. In the epilogue to uh, this tremendous book, uh, Emilius quotes from Hemingway uh, in his book, Death in the Afternoon. Uh, his Hemingway's book about bullfighting, which is also a homage to Spain itself. Quoting thus, if I could have made this enough of a book, it would have had everything in it. To which Emilius adds his own gloss, if I could have made this enough of a book, it would have registered something of the acts of solidarity and sacrifice that dignify our societies of crisis. It would have registered the attempts to make sense of precariousness, of the insecurity that attaches to the sense that one's work is expendable, returning to the same devastating questions. Who will employ us? Are we too many? These devastating questions, but also these acts of solidarity and sense of dignity do indeed pervade this book. I know that other presenters are going to focus on some of the more complex analyses that the book presents. So I thought I would say something more about the tenor or the spirit of this work. I've had the immense good fortune to have known Emilius now for over 30 years since we were PhD students sharing an office, fondly known as the Banana Room, <laughs> high up in uh, the old college in Edinburgh. It was known as the Banana Room less for the ideas, I think, that uh, came out of it, although I admit that some of mine at the time were certainly uh, going in that direction, something that Amelius pointed out in his gentle way. David Hume and Stanley Fish, that's banana. <laughs> So anyway, we were in the banana room together all these years ago uh, because it was in fact shaped like a banana. I believe it's still there. The sense of politics, of political action, <coughs> of the critique of law, and a sometimes heretical reading of systems theory have been central to Emilius' work since these early days. 
And that is where, along with something else, something less common in the legal academy, poetry. And that's where the inspiration for this title, The Redress of Law, comes from. The Redress of Law is inspired by the great Irish poet Seamus Heaney and his redress of poetry, and refers, I quote, to the counterweighting, a balancing, a placing of a counter reality on the scales. It's this that informs the reading of constitutionalism that this book presents. Redress, I mean, it's right, aims to capture and where unavailable to force law's countervailing gesture. And this, he argues, requires perhaps above all strategic thinking of new and sometimes old, but always incisive strategies to redress those features of our contemporary conditions that not only foster, but prolong the harms so often unregistered in the dominant orders terms suffered by so many so often. Let me just say uh, one thing uh, about briefly about these conditions. There are so many places you could start, but I just picked one. Emilius quotes uh, Karl Polanyi's inspirational work, The Great Transformation, saying, Polanyi saying, laissez-faire was planned, planning was not. This is a crucial observation for the unveiling work that this book does. It chimes with an alternative, less academic, but equally memorable line, I think, uh, Kevin Spacey's character, you might remember in The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Well, the devil is exposed here, time and again. Sometimes it's in the detail, but not always. The complex legal and economic forms that allow market capture of the democratic constitution are traced brilliantly in this book. And building on this mode of critique, as well as market capture, we might also want to think about state capture, media capture, the sometimes literal capture that colonial expropriations have involved. And behind all this, and perhaps most significantly, a form of capture that ensnares by setting the terms of the engagement behind the backs of the actor and practices themselves. What Pashukanis identified in the legal form, a form that runs like the words in an old fashioned stick of rock through law in a capitalist society. But there are also challenges too. In the West, the social democratic constitution was always a capitalist constitution. Not only did it never truly challenge capitalism's founding norms, the commodity and the exploitation of labor for capitalist accumulation, but the social democratic constitution was entirely reliant on these. Combined with an insistent colonial expansionism of labor, land, natural resources, the short durée of the social democratic state relied on the fused legal and economic norms that likewise operated behind the backs of states, markets, constitutions, and so on. No social democratic formations look behind this, and no socialist constitutions, which did, remained either democratic or long-lived. It's a question then of whether a social democratic constitution even one open to the liberating potential energy of constituent power can be built upon a foundation of exploitation, a foundation which is legally and coercively entrenched at the core of a capitalist economy. Can solidarity emerge from within such a conceptual coercive nest of vipers? How can the law redress this? How can redress be possible in law? It's these observations that lead Emilius to forefront strategy. Strategic thinking, he writes, that finds its point of inscription in the breach. So strategy of rupture, strategies <coughs> that expose the limits of inclusion, that more naive democratic communicative models would miss. One last example, this question, 
do you understand? When said by the boss to the worker, it means not only do you understand the problem, but do you understand who's boss? Finally, tellingly, you understand an unwarranted inclusion. We have a deep-seated problem here, our problematic among forms of communication and miscommunication. Not just lies, but honest entreaties. Not just false promises, but true promises. But which, and this is the critical point, still cannot register harms appropriately. Cannot register the voices that say, in the words of another poet, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. There is no innocence here. The apparent innocence of transparent communication may indeed be the devil's doing with its cheery flattery and its winking complicities. That's what we need to be wary of. That's what we need to understand, to see better, to redress. The book's epilogue contains another line from Hemingway, one that I've always found inspirational. It says this, the great thing is to last and to get your work done and see and hear and learn and understand and write when there is something that you know and not before and not too damn much after either. So here it is, timely and timeless to redress the wall. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, and Milius is next. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, <laughs> Scott will see his imprint on, on the work because uh, 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 since those days of the banana room, as he said, he has been my, my closest academic and beloved and friend. It, it is very... Um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for those who attend. It is a real privilege. What I was going to do in the, to begin with is say something about the book. I appreciate that um, not everyone has read it. It runs at 600 pages, so it's, um, it's not, Easy, it, 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 it asks, it demands time. Um, I've actually made some notes in order to keep this as concise as I can. Um, but I want to say something mainly about the architecture of the book and some of the key issues I run through it. Um, again, so that um, in a sense, we can all keep up the speed. Okay, so the... Sym symmetry is something that I got you know, very obsessive about um, in, in the writing of this book. The book has four parts. Each part has four chapters, and all 16 chapters are nearly exactly the same length. And while this may oh, seem God. like a very <laughs> odd undertaking, I did it because each of these chapters could um, turn into a book in their own right. Okay, so what I wanted to do, and what is important about the book, is the linkages. I wanted to insist on the linkages. I wanted to make sure that what I said about critical phenomenology would, could be read off the constitutional argument. Um, what could said, be said about strategy be informed by the critical phenomenology, and again, take its point of departure from the constitutional argument. So apart from this, um, this grid, the four parts with the four chapters, let me say something about the four parts. The first is a, an attempt to establish a critical phenomenology. The last is an argument about constitutional strategy. So the bookend parts of the, of the book are about what appears and how we can act on what appears. And what doesn't, crucially, what isn't allowed to appear. 
The two middle parts of the book are about constitutionalism and they, they track a, a great deformation. If you go back to Colani and it's like paraphrase Colani since Scott's already brought him up. The deformation of political constitutionalism, which is part two, into market constitutionalism, part two. Um, it, it, it tracks the process whereby the constituent side of constitutional thinking, the political moment of constitutionalism, is abandoned to market thinking. And if that wasn't enough in terms of architecture, there are also two currents that run horizontally across. So chapter three of each part is about work. Initially, the critical phenomenology of work, then what it means to politically constitutionalize work and to treat it as a social right. Then the process of its deep commodification under market thinking. And then finally, what is perhaps the, the most um, uh, flamboyant uh, <laughs> chapter in the book, what, it, what, what, the cons what labor means as constituent uh, in an argument about autogestionnaire politics. And the second thing that runs horizontally across the book is this, this argument about semantics and structures. And this is an argument about how to resist structural drift, what it means not to lose the language of constitutionalism. Okay, so this again is in four installments. In each case, it's an attempt to say there is something, there is a profound loss that is a loss of the constitutional language um, that we are losing to total market thinking. And what it might mean to hold the line, what it might mean to hold against structural drift. Okay, so that's that's how the book holds together. What I, I'd like to do now is say something more about the first part, which is perhaps the, the most difficult part. The problem with having it first is it might put people off. The chapters, uh, the other parts of the book, I think, are much more readable. Um, but, I, but it was very important for me, this, this, this part on critical phenomenology, and I want to say something about it. And I know I'll say something much shorter about the other three parts. So critical phenomenology, this emphasis is necessary because what underlies and informs the book is what we might call um, the distribution of appearance. What appears? on a register of the constitution as potentiality, as fact, as possible redress, yeah, what appears, what is denied appearance, what is forced upon us as necessary, as opposed to contingent, and what, if we are lucky, and if we play the strategic card correctly, we might force to appear. Okay, so in that sense, critical phenomenology, which is all about phenomenology, is about appearance. It's about this dynamic of appearing, disappearing, forcing to appear, redressing what appears as necessary when it is an outcome of clear political choice and therefore can be acted on. Um, when it comes to labor, the denial of appearance, the disappear of, of of, um, of labor takes its most devastating form, as Marx told us in the cipher of community, what Lukacs called reification. And the phenomenology of labor, if it's a critical phenomenology, is then tasked with a near impossible project of recovering the meaning of labor, the meaning of collective labor, the meaning of social labor as a political project. Uh, now this is a, this task is undertaken in the in the third in chapter three. It's a nearly impossible chapter to read. <laughs> when I come back to it, I feel um, slightly embarrassed about how difficult it is. But in any case, um, that is where this idea of phenomenological blockage appears. This idea of what it means for something to insert itself 
in a way that makes it impossible to circumvent it, right? impossible to redress. And reification carries that, right? it forces an appearance that we cannot get behind. Now, this is a reification that is, I wouldn't say celebrated in Aaron's work, but it's clearly very convenient to Aaron because it allows her to relegate labor to the sphere of necessity. It allows her to say that labor as part of necessity is unworthy of politics. This is one of the most extraordinary conceptual moves in the history of thought to devalue labor. And in Habermas, who follows her so closely here, labor is put on the side of instrumental reason as contrasted communicative reason. And again, this categorical departure allows him to say nothing about labor, you know, which is again an extraordinary allusion. In Simone Weil, who is a key uh, philosopher in the book, a key, she, she, I, I, um, she carries a lot of, of, of the argument that I find so hugely inspiring. This impossibility to claim the political meaning of labor is undertake, undertaken on an existential register uh, through this, um, this idea of courage. And then in the last part of this, this, this chapter on critical phenomenology, I kind of try, try and make sense of this phenomenology as a counter method, again, again through Simone Weil and the notion of attention, what it means to pay attention, um, how this paying attention may force a breakthrough in the term dissensus in here. In all these cases, what is at stake is to um, insert some critical distance against uh, and away from these immediate disclosures, these disclosures that force themselves upon us with a sense of self evidence Okay, that trap us in the sort of world as it is, uh, the fait accompli, that this is, this, this is what it is. The violent econometrics of labor, the truths so of indicators and, and benchmarking. And it ends on what I think is the, the most profound move in critical phenomenology, which is Marx's 11th thesis, the, the, the most Hegelian moments in Marx, his most profound Hegelian moments. So when Hegel says philosophy thinks the world as it is, the real, therefore as rational, so much is waged and wagered in this therefore, this connection between the real and the rational. And therefore, what cannot be understood and what cannot be interpreted in terms of those contradictory iterations of capitalism, those irrationalities with which class society is fraught, the idea that value is exchange value, the idea that solidarity is exchange, the idea that, I don't know, um, association and assembly are individual rights. Uh, the idea that freedom is the compulsion to take any work that is offered at any price. Yeah, these are irrationalities, these are deep contradictions, and they do not merit in the, the, to be understood as anything but blockages of thought. Okay, so hence the, for the real to be rational, we have to, as Marx puts it in the 11th thesis, no longer collapse the world in these fraught understandings, but transcend them, these thought disclosures. Um, so they are profound pathologies. They drag along them the possible semantics of redress. They bury them in structural assumptions. And that's why in the end, strategy becomes so important. And at that point, certain key decisions have to be made. Um, Scott was very kind to um, talk about the kind of strategy of rupture. And that is, that is one of the strategies. 
But the, the, there is a very important strategic decision that has to be made about whether to play the law to, to resist it or to use it, that's the third strategy, in the way of imminent critique, which means hold it up to its aspiration, hold it up to the value it suggests to us, even if this holding up to the value means that it has to be, the system has to be transformed because it cannot deliver this right. Uh, what's key about him and critique is this, this, this aspiration that cannot be met from the point of view of how the economy of the system works. So these are strategic considerations. One, one chapter is called Milton Formalisms. It's the idea that there are, the formalism matters, that um, if the Finns decide that they want to protect their workers, then we have to, as Christian who is here, says we have to protect democratically enacted law. And that is what formalism demands. So the militant formalist moment is a moment to hold on to law when it matters strategically, to abandon the law when it does not deliver anything but injustice. And, and the autogestion argument is one that looks at the Polish movement of solidarity, actually, as a key moment of autogestion politics and um, imminent critique. Okay, I should probably, maybe I can say a few more minutes about the second and third parts, but I'll be very brief here. So the second uh, part on political constitutionalism starts with the idea that the constitutional distinction is a distinction, this is very familiar ground, constitutional theorists, the distinction between constituent power and constituted power. Um, I want to insist on the political moment that is captured by constitu constituent power. Um, and as, if you like, where the energies of the constitution are deposited, the moment of, that allows the constitution sometimes to accelerate, that allows us to rethink who we are in terms of the constitution, that allow us to reorient constitutional thinking towards meeting social needs and social justice, this is the bit of political constitutionalism that is captured by the moment of the constituent and that keeps it alive. That is my argument. I want to resist the usual argument that the minute you talk about constituent power, you're stuck in some naive idea of the politics of presence, or you're some, or you, you're Robespierre or some crazy Bolshevik who thinks that, uh, you know, um, all the general will has to do is will and it will be law. I, 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 won't, I, I don't care for those debates very much, but I do hope on to hold on to this idea of the constituent, not as pure presence, but as the possibility, if you like, to storm the ways in which typically um, the constitutional vocabularies are mobilized and, and to use them otherwise. Um, and then there is, so what is this constitutional vocabulary? I use Newman here to give precision to what the formal constitutional means in terms of entrenchment, rationalization. Um, I talk about the social constitution with a special emphasis on labor. What does it mean to rationalize it and protect it? And here I use Alain's work, Alain Secure's work on the dogmatic resources of the social constitution. And then I worry about this unmooring of the constitution it's storming by all the constitutional pluralisms, which inflate the language of constitution. So everything is constitutional at all levels. And then this other extraordinary pathology that is captured by the idea of constitutionalization, where the constitution is no longer what we enact as constitution, but what sediments as constitution, as a process of typically market exposure. Yeah? So I want to, I want to resist that. And now that leads me into, and I will finish with this, the grand pathology, which is market constitutions. And I think we have to be very careful here because it's very easy to be too sweeping in the critique. 
There is huge amount of incredibly bad literature on markets, but there's also some really intelligent literature on markets. Both can be found in Hayek himself. I mean, you have the, some appalling books like The Mirage of Social Justice or you know, The Road to Serfdom. And then you have some quite ingenious works like Market as Discovery Procedure. Let's look at the last of the latter. Huh? Let's look at what, what it is about markets that, that, that allow this epistemological art, huh? the, the taking over of the constitutional imaginary by markets um, in, that, in that sense. And here under total market thinking, there is this idea that the market has been reconfigured, both in terms, again, of a quantification that is going mad in terms of metrics, syndicators, benchmarking, what I learned talks governance by numbers, which has shifted the relationship between cognitive and normative expectations. We know we've abandoned normative expectations to cognitive expectations. We've, we've abandoned what we want to protect to expectations about what works better. Yeah? And then at the meta level, the same thing works in terms of this idea of better knowledge is imposed through coordination, the open method of coordination, forcing constitutional systems themselves into, into competition. You have the appalling phenomenon of constitution shopping as part of the race to the bottom. We are the crazy and we're familiar with this. And in the European context, by forcing states to devalue the only variable still at their disposal, work um, in the race to the bottom. We will talk about this later, so I won't say anything more about the, the European misadventure. And there is some angst, let me finish about this, there is some angst amongst European labor lawyers. There is even some angst amongst the people who talk about quantifications. Uh, I was reading something by Sally, Sally Engel Mary recently, the seduction of quantification. And she says there is some angst in, in that work and saying, well, maybe we've gone, we've removed the process of decision making too far from the, the, the things that matter to people and the interpretations of people themselves mobilized in their local context. And let's try to reattune it to that. That's, that's the work. I mean, these are not credible concessions. And there's a whole point about indicators, is it's precisely they are there to block that bridge back to the local. You know, indicators, benchmarking is an exclusionary mechanism to stop looking at the various things that produce uh, these. Um, the very the kind of meaning that those practices have and allow them to circulate at some level where they can be weighted against each other in some non-interpretive way. That, that is the point of our conversation. Anyway, I'll stop there. Again, thank you all very much for, for listening and Great, thank you very much for this uh, illuminating uh, introduction and survey of the arguments of the book. Uh, our next speaker for the morning session is Alain Soupio, who is a professor at the Collège de France and already has been quoted um, this morning. Alain, welcome. And uh, it's nice to have you with us. You have about 15 to 20 minutes uh, for your contribution. <clears throat> Hello, yes, um, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to say how sorry I am not to be here in person today. I was very much uh, looking forward to this meeting uh, in the good company of Emilio's book for now six weeks. And uh, unfortunately, I just come out of a bad cold, which has uh, hampered my travel capacity and not to mention my mental capacity, I'm afraid. So the winds uh, were against me anyway, since uh, yesterday air traffic is very disrupted in uh, 
fronts due to strikes in uh, airports. I must also ask for your indulgence as uh, the organizer were kind enough for permitting me to speak in French and thus gave spare you the torment of my broken English, but uh, it's a duty for me to be brief. So I switch for French very, for, for this short comment. Um, le livre d'Emilio, c'est un grand livre. C'est l'image qui me vient à son sujet, c'est celle d'un banquet philosophique. Ce livre évoque à plusieurs reprises la figure de Dionysos, sans s'arrêter sur l'ambivalence de Dionysos, qui, selon les savants travaux de notre amie Cornelia isler kereni n'est pas l'antithèse d'Apollon et de la raison, mais c'est un passeur. C'est l'homme des banquets. Et le banquet, c'est un lieu où, avec l'aide du vin, mais d'un vin tenu dans une coupe euh, de ce type, l'acmé de l'esprit est atteint sans sombrer dans l'ébriété. Et c'est aussi un lieu de conversation. Eh bien, on retrouve cet esprit du banquet dans, philosophique dans tout le livre, qui non seulement donne à voir avec une érudition époustouflante le meilleur de la pensée de la philosophie du droit et du droit constitutionnel, mais entre dans une véritable conversation avec des auteurs de tous horizons, dont quelques invités de marque tels que Karl Marx ou Luhmann en particulier. Et notre rencontre d'aujourd'hui prolonge cette conversation et nous invite donc, comme dans le banquet, à la fois à la vivacité intellectuelle, mais aussi à la mesure. Alors, étant le, parmi vous le barbare dans ce banquet qui ne m'exprime pas dans la langue de l'Empire, je vais donc tâcher d'être bref et me limiter à, à trois propos. D'abord, c'est la première chose qu'on doit faire, c'est payer ses dettes. Donc, je vais essayer très brièvement de dire quelle est en tout cas ma dette vis-à-vis -vis de ce livre. Et puis, ensuite, je suggérerai quelques thèmes possibles de conversation avec vous et avec Emilios. Quant à notre dette, eh bien, elle est très grande, puisque je, je dis d'emblée que mon plein accord avec le, le diagnostic qui est posé par Emilios sur l'état à la fois de privatisation et de réification du monde entraîné par la logique de la globalisation. Et de ce processus de globalisation, de ses effets normatifs, Emilios nous brosse une fresque tout à fait impressionnante. Et ce n'est pas simplement un vaste panorama, c'est aussi dans le détail que l'on trouve dans son livre un certain nombre de critiques particulièrement éclairantes. J'en mentionne quelques-unes pour mémoire. Par exemple, sa critique du pluralisme constitutionnel et de l'idée de constitution sans État. Je pensais, en lisant sa critique, à ce fait que l'Union soviétique, par exemple, n'avait jamais voulu se définir comme un régime, mais comme une construction. C'était la construction du socialisme. Eh bien, de même, on pourrait dire, l'Union européenne aujourd'hui, telle qu'elle est analysée par Emilio, se présente elle aussi comme un mouvement sans fin de construction qui ne laisse aux êtres humains aucun moment de repos ou de stabilité. Euh, autre critique particulièrement 
pertinente, celle du fonctionnalisme comme facteur de dépolitisation. J'invite vraiment ceux qui n'auraient pas encore lu le livre à s'arrêter sur ces pages, ou bien euh, les pages où il critique euh, l'utilisation par les juges du principe de proportionnalité et comment cela peut conduire à l'effacement des garanties du droit. Et euh, évidemment, je rejoins tout à fait sa critique de l'ubris, euh, en particulier de la Cour de justice de l'Union européenne. Et de tous ces éléments de diagnostic, s'il ne fallait en retenir qu'un, qui est remarquablement analysé dans le livre, c'est celui du passage d'exigences euh, normatives, normative expectation, à des exigences cognitives. Nous avons là, je crois, euh, un diagnostic qui est aussi un outil heuristique pour nous situer dans le temps euh, présent. Alors, j'en viens à énumérer euh, quelques thèmes de discussion qui sont aussi peut-être, Emilio se le verra, des thèmes euh, où je suis plus interrogatif. Le premier, c'est la question de la sémantique et de la normativité des concepts. Ce point est assumé par Emilios dans son livre. Les concepts ont en eux-mêmes une valeur normative. Et l'une des difficultés dans lesquelles nous sommes aujourd'hui, c'est une difficulté sémantique. C'est de ne pas avoir les mots qu'il faut pour penser et décrire le monde présent. Ce que je me demande, mais là aussi c'est une question de barbare, je ne suis pas un spécialiste de philosophie ou de théoricien du droit, mais en rentrant dans ce monde, je suis frappé par la tendance à prêter au concept une universalité et une intemporalité qu'ils n'ont pas. Je, je le ressens en particulier dans toutes les, le passage, tous les passages du livre concernant l'analyse euh, systémique, mais c'est valable plus généralement sur tout notre appareil euh, conceptuel. Euh, pour rendre cela concret, euh, j'évoquerai un débat euh, qui a été un débat français assez peu connu, mais qui me semble bien poser les enjeux intellectuels qui sont encore les nôtres. Je suis euh, un grand admirateur de Montesquieu. Et vous savez que Montesquieu, non seulement dans l'esprit des lois, mais d'abord dans les lettres persanes, nous invite, pour nous comprendre nous-mêmes, à passer par le regard des autres. Et c'est ce que font ces persans qui sont transportés dans la France du XVIIIe siècle. Et cette approche, ouverte à la diversité des histoires et des cultures, a fait l'objet des critiques extrêmement violentes d'un autre philosophe des Lumières qui était Condorcet. Et Condorcet écrit dans quelques pages « Mais pourquoi Montesquieu s'intéresse-t-il » aux usages et aux rites des Chinois, si la raison est une, les lois doivent être une sur l'ensemble de la planète. Je vois dans cette discussion une préfiguration de ce qu'est l'imaginaire de la globalisation, l'imaginaire d'un monde uniforme, communiant dans une même langue, dans les mêmes droits individuels et dans la même foi dans un ordre spontané du marché. Euh, ce me semble être un mirage, mais je souhaiterais savoir, c'est la question que je pose à Emilios, où il se situerait dans ce débat. Est-ce que lorsque dans le livre on parle de l'État, est-ce que ça veut dire la même chose en France au Royaume-Uni, en Grèce ou en Chine Et sinon, est-ce que notre démarche face à la globalisation n'exigerait pas un travail patient de confrontation de nos catégories de pensée euh, 
En ce qui me concerne, j'ai essayé, mais c'est intraduisible en, en anglais, c'est une raison de plus pour vous remercier de me supporter en français, de ne pas confondre la notion de globalisation qui renvoie à ce mouvement d'uniformisation avec une notion de mondialisation qui correspond au grec « cosmos » par opposition à « chaos », c'est-à-dire d'un monde destiné à demeurer divers, imprévisible, dont il faut respecter la diversité, mais assurer la coopération. Le deuxième thème de, euh, que je suggérerais d'aborder, si nous avons le temps de discuter, c'est euh, plus la question de sémantique, mais celui de la diversité justement des régimes normatifs. Euh, il y a une. Emilios me fait dans ce livre l'honneur de me rapprocher de Lon Fuller euh, et de me mettre dans la boîte juste naturaliste. C'est un honneur que je suis obligé de décliner euh, car je crois qu'il ne correspond pas du tout à ce que j'ai essayé d'avancer autour de la fonction anthropologique du droit. Ce qui est universel, c'est l'anthropos et la nécessité où il se trouve de vivre à la fois dans l'univers organique de ses sens et dans un monde d'images et de donner à sa vie un sens. Ça, c'est une question qui se pose en toute civilisation et y répondre est indispensable à l'institution de la raison humaine. En ce sens, j'ai trouvé passionnant dans le livre la dialectique du constituant et du constitué, mais elle me semble pouvoir être étendue au-delà de l'institution d'un corps politique à l'institution de l'être humain lui-même. Chacun de nous est institué par les catégories normatives qui l'accueillent. Alors, si l'on prend acte de cette l'universalité de cette question, il faut aussi prendre acte de la diversité des réponses qui lui ont été apportées historiquement. Je m'en tiendrai, puisque je parle à un savant qui est aussi un savant grec, à la distinction Orient-Occident que nous devons au grand schisme de l'Église orientale et occidentale. Peut-on dire que la notion d'État, je le disais tout à l'heure, ait la même signification en grec ou dans le monde russe et puis dans les Occidents Parce que là aussi, il faudrait distinguer l'Occident latin, sans doute, mais aussi dans le monde américain. Euh, la personne à qui je dois mon « hay fever » est un ami japonais que j'ai reçu, qui vient de publier en France un livre qui s'appelle « L'impérialisme de la liberté » et qui tâche de capturer ce qui est spécifique dans les formes de l'impérialisme américain par rapport aux formes traditionnelles de l'Europe continentale. L'Europe continentale pense frontières, territoires, tandis que l'Amérique pense espace de liberté fondé sur la propriété sans limite. Et le choc de ces différentes façons de penser l'Empire bah, se donne à voir aujourd'hui peut-être même en Ukraine. Donc, puisque notre problème commun, c'est d'essayer de penser au-delà des impasses de la globalisation, je crois que nous, nous devons tenir compte de cette diversité des systèmes normatifs. Euh, cette diversité est aussi ontologique, mais je ne veux pas être trop long, donc je vais passer très vite. Simplement, je souligne à quel point le livre est éclairant dans sa critique du behaviorisme, du cognitivisme, de tout ce qui est à la mode derrière la technique des nudges, de la compliance 
euh, et de, nous, en, en France, notre président de la République, pendant la, le Covid, a préféré dire « je ne veux rien interdire ni obliger, mais je vais emmerder ceux qui ne se vaccinent pas ». Donc, nous sommes là dans un régime de normativité qui est celui du comportementalisme, qui ne mise pas sur l'éducation, mais sur le dressage et sur les réflexes conditionnés. Autrement dit, la normativité juridique est aux prises avec d'autres types de normativité, et cela depuis plus d'un siècle. Donc là aussi, c'est une question que j'aurais aimé poser à Emilio, c'est comment est-ce qu'il situe cette expérience singulière qui a été celle des totalitarismes du XXe siècle euh, et de leur maniement de l'État, c'est-à-dire l'asservissement de l'État à ce qui était considéré comme un ordre scientifique révélé par la science de la société. Est-ce que ce que nous vivons avec la globalisation néolibérale, si on prend le cas de Hayek, n'est pas dans le sillage de ce qu'ont qu été ces expériences qui entendent assujettir l'État et le droit, non plus à des lois transcendantes inscrites dans des livres sacrés, mais dans des lois immanentes révélées par la science. Il me semble que ça, c'est un des enjeux très importants du livre. Et je terminerai par un... Dernière question, mais je vais pouvoir être bref, c'est de demander à Emilios comment il voit l'avenir de cette forme, l'État, dans sa diversité d'expressions historiques. Nous savons que c'est une invention médiévale. Nous savons aussi qu'elle a subi plusieurs révolutions, nous le savons euh, par les travaux notamment de, de Berman. Et euh, est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, il est voué à disparaître Quel diagnostic pouvons-nous poser sur sa situation contemporaine Est-ce que, Emilios, euh, tu ferais tienne l'analyse que, avec d'autres, j'ai pu proposer de dire que nous revenons à des formes d'allégeance qui s'éclairent au regard des catégories du droit médiéval. Il ne s'agit pas de dire que nous revenons au Moyen Âge, mais de dire que l'histoire du droit n'est pas une histoire linéaire, c'est une histoire stratigraphique. Et lorsque le modèle centralisé autour de l'État territorial s'effrite, on voit ressurgir les euh, logiques, les dispositifs, les structures d'allégeance. Euh, et ceci, me paraît-il, me semble-t-il, se voit aussi bien dans l'ordre économique, dans les chaînes de production internationales, dans l'ordre euh, des relations internationales, où nous sommes vraiment face à des logiques d'empire. Euh, au fond, c'est ça. Est-ce que l'État j'ai fini le livre sans vraiment comprendre la vision que Emilio savait de l'État. Est-ce qu'il y voit comme Marx un instrument de domination de classe dont il faut se débarrasser Mais au fond, cette vue qu'il faut se débarrasser de l'État, c'est aussi celle des néolibéraux. D'ailleurs, je me permets d'ajouter au dossier déjà très volumineux réuni par Emilios un article d'Ayek de 1939 où il voit dans la constitution de fédération économique à l'échelle continentale le moyen de castrer les États et d'empêcher que la démocratie se mêle de la répartition des richesses. Dès 1939, il y a ça. Eh bien, euh, c'est ça ma question. Est-ce que l'État, nous devons y voir une forme dépassée et tenter de nous accommoder de ce nouveau régime d'empire et d'allégeance Ou bien est-ce que euh, c'est de lui que peut revenir la solution Est-ce qu'il est capable d'une nouvelle révolution 
du type de celle qui a été l'invention, la grande invention du XXe siècle, qui a été l'invention de l'État social, qui a été la réponse démocratique euh, aux euh, critiques euh, qui ont conduit ailleurs aux expériences euh, totalitaires. Voilà, excusez-moi d'avoir été euh, trop long euh, et toutes mes excuses pour ceux qui n'ont rien compris. <rire> Et ça leur donne... um, very well. So I think what I'm going to do now is give Emilio five minutes because some direct questions were posed by Alan's paper. And then we will open it to discussion just to agree on the rules for the discussion for those online. Please use the, the hand symbol, if you can, uh, to, uh, so that I can put you on the, on the queue and leave the hand on until um, I pass on to you. And then please lower the hand after you have spoken, because otherwise I cannot uh, follow the sequence. Um, so, Emily, you have um, a few minutes. Okay, I will refer to a, a less elegant language. Uh, <laughs> but thank you very much, Anil, for your for super such for such praise and um, and and you know I agree with very much of what you just said. Um, I won't I won't go over the bits we agree on. Um, but I will just say a few things about your two questions. Um, the first one, if I understood correctly, were, was around the normativity of concepts and the, the contrast between Condorcet and Montesquieu in terms of the uh, invention of a, of a language that would have been inclusive in the sense of substituting for the more local understandings and the, the kind of the idea of language as a depository of hermenia of, of hermeneutics which is inherent in this idea of normativity of concepts so let me just say something about this and i'll say where i stand um, so there is a there is a section in in, in the book which is perhaps more analytical than any other section, which looks at the question of whether uh, some of the discussions we have are discussions about how we understand the normative significance, the significance, the normative significance of concepts, um, whether when we use concepts, we make certain carry certain implicit normative assumptions, whether, for example, when we use the term, when we have a discussion about whether, I don't know, um, capital punishment is cruel, we carry in those discussions certain implicit understandings of cruelty, of what it means to, for some to be cruel. When we discuss the question more close to our, our field, whether the right of association includes the right to strike, whether we have in our discussion certain assumptions that underlie and inform the meaning of the term association. Yeah? So, and I think there's something irreducible about the, these implicit meanings and something worth holding on to. So I'm with Montesquieu and you on this, rather than the flattening attempt and the deracinating attempt to impose an idiom that might allow a conversation across the board at the cost of these hermeneutical debts. I'm a bit, there is still a question hanging over all this, whether this is compatible with systems theory, but I won't go into that because it's, I don't know if it is, <laughs> I'd rather Please not. Um, I'm gonna cut my own uh, argument. <laughs> Um, now, the question of the state, of course, and the, I mean, I like, I like all the stuff about the imperialism of liberty and the way in which, uh, 
your Japanese friend who gave you the, <laughs> the cold talks about uh, how that is understood. Um, what, what I suppose, and I'm sorry also, um, I attributed an argument made by Fuller to you. I, I just wonder whether some of the issues, whether I have too quickly used the argument I borrow from you around dogma in a way that take, takes it too close to what Fuller said about aspiration and duty. So there is a kind of sense that I took from you, the whole discussion of dogma, a twofold thing. On the one hand, dogma means that there is nowhere further to move so that the dogmatic resources of, the, of law cannot be transcended into a different plateau where, for example, economic truths may have um, yielded better solutions, yeah? So there is a sense in the dogmatic that it, one is that in the sense in which it is axiomatic, but that is the source and the point of normative regress. You don't go any further than that. Yeah? The ratio juris has an integrity that is then in the second direction requires us to concretize yeah? in the way of and that's where perhaps the determinatio idea that I take from Fuller, but I don't, again, this may have been attributing too much. In terms of the, of the state, and I think this is, this is hugely important, and um, it reminded me as you, as you were talking, because you talked also about, about tragedy and mythology and the Greeks, that the state in tragedy never speaks so you have you have this extraordinary, this devastating image in, in the tragedy Prometheus bound. So Iphistos is taking Prometheus to hammer him onto the onto the mountain, the rocks in the Caucasus, the Caucasus mountain, and he has with him his two helpers. The two helpers are Via and Kratos, violence and state, and they say nothing. So Iphistos is making a few. I mean, it doesn't help that Aeschylus only allows one, <laughs> one protagonist to ever speak. But th there, is, there is an issue there about the silence, uh, the silent force that is the state in this. Um, this may be taking it too far. I, I think on this, I would be, I would suggest, and this I'll, I'll close that the, the, the state is a specific organizational form at a very specific time in history allowed it to deliver certain important functions. At the same time, it played a very particular role in terms of class rule and the configuration of class rule. This is a field that uh, has been well visited. I don't know if the form of the state is redundant at this moment, whether we can use it um, in terms of um, um, you know, in, in, in the field today or whether it is, uh, but one, one thing I would say, and this takes me back to um, a dilemma the Greeks faced only very recently. And I was writing the book during this period, which was formative for, for us Greeks, which were the six months of the series of resistance to the European um, diktats was that the form of the state, the idea of the state as sovereign, the idea of budgetary sovereignty, did play a huge role politically in terms of envisaging how the Greeks, you know, when holding on to the state form and those that idea of sovereignty might have resisted the devastation. Now we were defeated. But the fact that over those six months, something was mobilized and was mobilized in turn of the Greek state is important. So I will not, I, I hope this isn't avoiding your question. I think the, the, the question of what precise organizational form might allow us um, um, to, might allow redress, the, the type of 
um, is an open system. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks, Emilius. Um, so I, Marco allows me to go 10 minutes into the lunch break. So we have uh, 25 minutes now for discussion. So please, um, hands here in the room or online. Many things have been raised, so I will break the ice. Yes. So it's a follow up to Alan's uh, point on the state and the Mino's answer now. And it more or less, I think, revolves around the choice of the main sources of, uh, of the Mino's constitutional theory. I mean, how far can you go? I mean, let me start with this, sorry. So Bob Jessup has this nice anecdote about Luhmann. He says, look, I was going to a conference 35 years ago, these one world sociological conferences. And I ended, uh, I ended up being on the same flight with Luhmann. And I just introduced myself as a young researcher. And, um, and Luhmann asked me what was my research topic. And I said, look, I do basically state theory. And one answer is that the state does not exist. So you don't have a research topic. <laughs> so my I mean, I tend to believe that this is a true anecdote, but we don't know it. I mean, we just have to rely on, uh, on Jessop's words. So my question is that how far can you go there in terms of, you know, um, I would say approaching the resources that an organizational form of the law can give you if, your starting point and your your entry point actually, no? to the question of the organization is 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 functional differentiation and this might connect actually to the other point made by by alan which is indeed you no know, the fact that that there is something probably deeply eurocentric um, by choosing this entry point i mean we have also a few charts about this no but but Luhmann's conception of the organization of the form of the law and, and, uh, and, and the structural coupling mechanism seems to imply that he's just talking about the European state, the European modern state. So I wonder how much leverage, you know, starting from this perspective, gives you in order to understand, say, the transformation of the forms of the political rule. For example, I think Alain suggested that if you begin from that starting point, the imperial form of, of the political unity escapes no, from the horizon, not register it. No? So things like the, the US no, as an imperial constitutional form, China as an imperial constitutional form, and so forth and so on, they just don't register because you know there, there the functional differentiation doesn't play out and has never played out in the same way. No? Because of the role of the borders, the material limits, and uh, the, the relationship with the geopolitical position and so forth and so on. So I wanted you to, to, um, to unpack a bit you know, how much of these premises are actually embedded in, uh, in, in, uh, in the idea that the law can still provide in terms of form of political unity, uh, a means for address. Thanks, Matt. I don't see any other hand for now. So Emily, if you want to. Yeah, well, great. I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really easy question. Thank you, Mark. Okay, I mean, let me let me caveat it by saying I, my use of Luhmann is very select. Okay, so I only use it when it sits. <laughs> so the idea that, uh, and the question, of course, is how selective can you be? Um, and how much of the conceptual baggage can you lose in employing it? My, I would say quite a bit. I would say quite a bit. I mean, the trouble is I struggled with this all my life and all my academic life because I detest so many of the starting points and assumptions of Lewis. And still he has, and he has, he gives you something of extraordinary to waste. Right. So that's always been a problem. So, Selective, yeah. So my, if you like, even the, the idea of the entry point is a little bit um, carries too much, okay? Because it's not, yeah. Of, of course, at some point, one has to break into a discussion 
But the question of how much of that conceptual baggage you carry into it, I think, can be negotiated. Um, now, Luhmann, I mean, uh, he probably did say that to Jesse, most probably. Um, but he will say that functional differentiation was organized under the auspices of the state, you know, in early modernity. So there is a sense of which the state is there as the main political form that allows forms of structural coupling amongst politics, law, and the economy. Yeah. Now, um, let me ask, answer this part of your question, then I'll, I'll take the empire. So the, the question then becomes, well, if, can you hold on to this idea of functional differentiation beyond the state? That's the first question. The second one is a normative question. Is it worth holding on to it beyond the state? Because what does it deliver? And let's face it, Capitalism has always been incredibly comfortable with functional differentiation because it allows, if you like, the autopoiesis of the economy. The economy can run on its own devices. It can, you know, marshal its own forms of legitimation. It can, and it, it, it can keep politics out. And that's why, that's why you can see human really likes this stuff. It's interesting that Teufner is interested to see how, under conditions of globalization, you can find something resembling that uh, division of labor amongst systems of union. I, I agree with you that I am not sure that this, normally speaking, is important. I can see why there are aspects of it that are important, but I wouldn't say it is the only game in town. That's not to say that initially it wasn't the state against political unity. But the, the question of function differentiation um, as organized under the auspices of the state is, is a slightly separate issue. Should also say that um, the uh, now the question because of time. Now the question of the imperial form, again, what, one thing that perhaps doesn't come across in your in your you know, if you say, well, if you look, if you think of the imperial form, then the functional differentiation is problematic. Yes and no, because if you if you think of the way in which economic activity was organized, say through the East India Company, etc., there was an economic root to this. Of course, it was it was buttressed by some serious violence and casual violence, but there is an economic uh, side to, and there is therefore a a moment of functional differentiation, even under imperial conditions. But of course, there I would I think that so much there are other ways of understanding uh, imperial rule, in, including the kind of that, that involves the use of political power, military power, um, casual violence, accumulation by dispossession, and all that. So. Um, but I have Anna next. Thanks, Emilia. I found this uh, all very interesting. And I'm curious about something that you mentioned and the way you, I think, problematize constitutionalization as a phenomenon or as a process. Um, so you said that constitutionalization is no longer what is enacted, but what is sedimented by market exposure. And I was wondering what's the problem that you identify or that we're pointing at here? Is it about sedimentation in and by itself? Because it's a bit like difficult to control what sediments and what doesn't as a matter of social conventions, or is it that something sediments um, not through, I don't know, common law consensus about principles of what equality requires, if there's anything like that, not about the other social construction pathway, but whether the problem is actually market exposure. And if that's the problem, um, I wonder how, I, I wonder what has, what that really has to do with normative constitutionalism. I mean, how binding is it for officials, for citizens alike, uh, something that has been sedimented through market exposure, right? Is it a problem that we wrongly take it as it being something that the constitution tells us about 
for instance, how economy, how economy has to be ordered, or is it actually the case that that sedimentation of constitutional law or institutional design through market exposure truly and genuinely ought to bind officials? It's, it's a bit uh, that, that I don't. Yeah, no, no, thank you. I mean, uh, the reason for objective sedimentation and, uh, uh, or contextualization, um, and I'll be very brief and maybe a bit schematic because there, uh, there's more complexity here for sure. I mean, if you, if you look at, say, the work of Benedict Kingsbury, one of these people who talk about indicators and global governance, etc. They talk very clearly about what sediments as constitutional practice. Because that's, and it's also presented as an argument about humility. Let's assume we can, let's not assume we can run this thing. Let's allow practices that carry their own rationales and understandings to sediment. And then you have a constitutionalization of sort of global governance. And this suddenly they forget their humility and it becomes well, well this is democratic experimentalism because everyone's included and everyone can have and stakeholders and, and suddenly they suddenly they forget that what they started off as trying to an apologist be, from, from being apologists of what happened, suddenly they become um, they celebrate. Okay. But irrespective of that, there is something hugely problematic in the constitutional function about the term constitutionalization as an ongoing process. Because one of the things we associate with the constitution is this possibility to uh, enact, bring about a hierarchy um, that will allow us to qualify certain acts as legal and certain acts as illegal. The idea that if every time a normative expectation is disappointed, you just abandon it and something else that demands in its place is the problem. And that's not the solution. So it's the problem of losing normativity. So you say, if, if we can't enact something and hold to it, which was the great achievement of political constitutionalism as democratic societies, for example, we didn't want to destroy the dignity of workers. If every time dignity was, was being destroyed, it suddenly des sedimented as a new constitutional practice, then there's something hugely problematic about constitutionalization. You, you appreciate it's a bit schematic, but that, this is what's happening. Now, you may call it market exposure or not, but as an ongoing process, constitutionalization cuts away at this pre commitment that is part of how the normative world of political constitutionalism is. Thank you both. Um, I have three people on the list, um, Dan, Awol, and Jack. Um, I'll take the questions uh, separately, but please keep them as brief as possible. Sure. Dan, you go first. Yeah, okay. Um, well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, as you know, I've um, really enjoyed the bits of the book that I've to make my way all the way through all 600 pages. And I just have a, a question about um, failure, because um, you mentioned the Greek, uh, the failure of the Greek resistance, and it um, reminded me of the, the chapter on rupture. <coughs> and I just wonder if you could say some more, whether this reaches the book, or you could just expand a bit on the, the intersection between the success of forcing to appear and then the failure in terms of institutional practice. Um, so the, the, in the examples you given in the, the rupture chapter, there is a success in breaking through the distribution of the, uh, the real and the sensible and so forth. Um, but then in the end, there is a failure in terms of its return back to the constitutional distinction. And I just wonder if you could say part of the project of redress within the context of critical phenomenology, as I understand it, is the forcing to appear. But then, how or what is the relationship between that um, uh, moment of appearance and then, then the moment of reinscription in the institutional practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... 
I mean, we, we, we do not have a, a happy historical trajectory in terms of these moments where new institutional forms um, break out, appear. Um, it's, you know, Marx celebrated the greatest one during his time in the Paris Commune. I have a whole chapter on Poland, and of course, the Polish solidarity movement was crushed. It was crushed. It was crushed in two ways. It was crushed by Jaruzelski, and then it was crushed because the, the market commissars went to Poland and imposed a, an austerity plan, the likes of which had never been visited on anyone else. So there is, it was crushed in two ways. But that doesn't, what I want to say is that doesn't, um, I mean, institutional reinscription is an interesting uh, term here. What I suppose I wanted to say is that doesn't take away anything from the, the, the achievement that was both the, um, the commune or the solidarity movement, this moment of, of worker self-organization, the moment of a, of a labor constitution like Europe hasn't seen, or in a much smaller um, scale, the, the sort of Greek resistance. Um, so it's a kind of, it allowed something to appear institutionally, okay, because this, this was, well, what's important about this was that this was an experiment, an experiment with organizational form, it was an experiment with institutions. Um, and they are, the fact that they are defeated doesn't mean they're lost. So I don't know if I've answered your question, but I think I think there's something very important simply in the fact that something was broke through in a context where it had no room to break through. Remember, in the case of the Polish Solidarity Movement, this was this was a claim for workers' self-organization in a workers' republic. What does it even mean? Yeah, and that's that's interesting. Yeah, this this way in which something is forced through. And then the process of forcing through changes the way the thing is talked about. Um, I'm not saying the same thing definitely happened in the commune, I'm not saying it happened in, in Greece, but there's something really interesting about changing the terms of the debate. And something new broke into the, the imaginary, I think, you know, a, a real sense of possibility. And the reason why we so feel we feel so betrayed now is because because something was realized for those six months. Thanks. Um, I was, hi, good to see you. How are you? Hi, George, can you hear me? Yeah, you're next. Yeah, C can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you, George. Um, hi, Emilio. Hi, Scott. Um, very good to see you, Scott, in a very long time. Um, uh, Emilios, um, as your former student and as somebody uh, inspired by your incredibly rich and wide-ranging body of scholarship and theoretical practice, can I just begin by saying to you that yours is intellectual work at best, at most rigorous, and most provocative. And I, as someone who used your work, um to to understand a range of different areas uh, you know i'm not just an academic i'm also uh, an activist and i i see uh how your work uh, shaped my own thinking and and the kind of um impact that uh, has produced in in my my own engagement and i think what your work does um at least in my uh, own practice is that it, it provides me with with a roadmap uh for for resistance, uh, particularly uh, your distinction between the strategic and the communicative in terms of uh, engagement with law. Um, and a lot of the debates uh, that I have heard while I was in Glasgow, which came together in this book, um, it, it continues to inspire me. Having said that, um, I just wanted to kind of pick up on the point that Alain and um, uh, Marco made. Uh, hi, Marco. There, how are you? Um, so I want to I want to bring it down a little bit because um, 
there are there are moments when um, I engage in in legal debates, um, active legal debates, and one of the things that I have been doing over the course of the last three four years, which I found extremely rewarding and impactful, is um, writing what are called the country of origin expert reports, uh, which are used in immigration and asylum cases before before judges. Yeah. So just to give you an idea of what this entails is that usually in immigration and asylum cases, judges are called upon to assess the credibility and the plausibility of issues that happen in a culture that they don't understand at all, in a political social environment that they don't understand at all. So, you know, it could be a UK British judge making um, an assessment of plausibility about you know, countries far removed from, from the UK, Horn of Africa, which I'm familiar with. And whenever I write this, this report, I actually write in, 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 in a way um, that kind of draws on your idea of strategic engagement with law. And I see it producing um, very good results in the sense that judges attach significant weight to what I have to say. And uh, this is mainly because um, I kind of draw uh, on, on those particular ways of thinking uh, about what so does and, and its impact and so on and so forth. So my question is, does this kind of intervention or does this kind of um, engagement with law and, and producing a positive outcome for a particular individual who is caught up in the legal system and whose account is misheard, misunderstood, actually count as a redress in law for you. Um, it's, it's oh, can I ask you to just, um, sorry. Um, I'll, could, could, could you restate that? Because there was a little bit of interference. Just, okay. just your question. Yeah, so the question is, would you consider these forms of intervention as a redress in law, or is your account of redress something, something more ambitious, something more revolutionary? Does, does that make sense in terms of what I have said? Yeah, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yes, no, um, well, first of all, thank you. And it's very it's, uh, great to continue our, our, our discussion of many years now. Um, and thank you, Al. The, pro probably the bits you liked is one of the bits I had most fun writing, the, the way in which the neat uh, division of labor between the communicative and the strategic uh, is presented, but doesn't actually work. And the not actually work is 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 um, one way of putting it because perhaps there is something else going on too. I mean, in the example that Scott uh, alluded to, where someone from a position of power says to someone, "Do you understand?" Um, the idea that this is a moment of communicative openness is simply naive. The question, do you understand, is not an invitation to explain again. It is, an it is a threat. It is a move to silence. It is not a, let me renew my explanation <laughs> in different ways. Um, now, so much of what's played out in the courtroom straddles these two modalities. Um, and you know that because you've worked on trials and we have discussed this. It's interesting how much of the work of redeeming law as a, in terms of modality of communication is done by missing the strategic ways in which law is deployed in order to silence. I think that's key. And to answer your question, I think, you know, no, not, it doesn't have to be on, on, on a revolutionary scale. It can be in the smaller acts of resistance in terms of courtroom practices, 
in terms of other forms of resistance. Um, there is nothing left. In a sense, this is not a, a programmatic book. It's just an attempt to say, look, given, given the situation we find ourselves in, what resources might the law provide that might make a difference to resisting this kind of appropriation of meaning and these kinds of strategic pieces? I hope I've answered it. I can. Thank you both. Um, and I have Jack as uh, the last on the list. Hi, Jack, how are you? I'm good. Hi, nice to see you all. Um, Congratulations, Emilio. It was a, a very interesting presentation as well. Obviously, um, an excellent book. Um, I won't keep you very long, as I'm sure you've got um, a, a very high-class lunch waiting for you next door from one of the uh, West West End's establishments. Yeah. Um, I actually, I think that the, the the questions that have come before me have probably provide the answer to my question anyway. Um, but I'll I'll insist, I suppose, um, in the spirit of the occasion. Um, I just was obviously probably comes as no surprise, Milios. I'm interested in the section on strategy um, and the way that you talk about the different types of strategy that are available. Um, and this idea of holding, holding on to um, you know, certain values that, that might exist in law and also holding law up to certain values which, which you know, we, we might insist upon, it obviously strikes, and strikes as a very difficult task for a number of reasons, but two reasons being that, first of all, any sort of legal action requires a cause of action. You, know, you, you need to present a particular claim in the particular terms which law can respond to um, in and of itself. And then the second issue being that certainly in the, you know, in relation to workers and labor law, the, the, the number of competing interests here are quite overwhelming at times. I mean, labor law not only offers you know, certain rights or you know, opportunities for imposing certain legal obligations, but it also, um, entrenches um, the conditions of employers' power um, um, and, and sort of those conditions of exploitation and domination. And particularly the history of you know, labor law is not necessarily one which is worker protective, but so often um, worker repressive. And I mean, just under the, you know, the, the many different institutional um, settings in which your sort of legal strategies might take place, it's so complicated and, and I mean the challenge also leads to the fact that even at the, the supranational level claims of collective labour law are, are so unlikely to, to receive any degree of redress particularly in relation to claims which emanate from the UK so I, I suppose in, in under these circumstances which are so overwhelming what does it necessarily mean to make particular claims of value especially where they don't necessarily translate into something that the law can even recognise or respond to I mean just to put it in a perhaps slightly more provocative way that insisting on the dignity of work for example is such a difficult claim and not necessarily one that a labor lawyer would recognize as something which they could reasonably stand up in a court and insist upon that would be something which would have to be translated and necessarily reduced to a particular claim which doesn't necessarily recognize or hold on to really sort of the power of the claim about a dignity of work so I suppose my question of strategy comes down to, although I, you know, clearly the, the, the militant form, formalisms are important, certainly um, offers a, a number of opportunities, but to what extent do the claims about dictative work, the sort of semantics around this and the semantics of value, to what extent do they become so dislocated from the institutional, um, you know, the institutional opportunities, let's say, that law offers to become ineffective uh, at, at different times? Yeah, um, I mean, they're, they're very difficult questions. Very different, difficult questions, Jack. And by the way, very nice to see you and thanks for participating. Um, and, um, and, and you're right that very often um, you put it very well that these opportunities, the, the dislocation from actual institutional opportunities that might have any um, any possibility of being successful? Um, I suppose the, the the question. It's also a very pessimistic view. I mean, I, what what I would like to uh, what I've tried to do 
is identify so kind of identify a range of possible responses so that where there has been uh, the possibility to draw on low zone resources we are able to do it and we can be quite imaginative very often in terms of of legal arguments even when they are very often defeated that doesn't mean that we cannot um, try them um, the i mean the, there is so much work on on human rights and social rights and there are there is so much work now done in terms of legal work and constitutional work and trying in terms of trying to understand uh, what those institutional opportunities are and i think that one of the reasons why this matters is because some of those institutional opportunities can still be seized. Um, maybe you're maybe you're not totally happy with this with this, but I, I I also don't want to end up I didn't want to end up with a book that simply said here is a most depressing diagnosis of the state <laughs> we are in, and um, let's. Um, just leave it at that. I mean, we, we have we have to be able to tell our students <laughs> that it's a reason why we are studying law. <laughs> and you know, there are reasons why we're studying law because these things really matter. And these things, these pathologies are things that invite us to react to them. And I think I think there is room. There is room. Conception. Excellent. Okay. On that note, and uh, because we do have the sandwiches here, <laughs> and uh, we would love to send you some virtual ones, but it's not possible yet. Thank you all for joining us remotely, and we will take a break until Zoom. two. Until two uh, o'clock. Five past two. Remember that there is a different link, Zoom link, for the afternoon session. Thank you all. Thanks to our speakers and thanks to Emilius.